Welcome to worship on this day. I invite you to take out your hymnal from the pew rack in front of you. Turn to hymn number 223, crown him with many crowns and join in singing uh, the praises of our Lord. Let's remain standing as we pray together. Gracious God, we have come this morning to crown our Lord with many crowns. We pray that our worship today will honor and glorify Jesus as he reigns upon his throne. We crown him the Lord of life and pray that our living Lord will come into the dead places in our own lives with resurrection power. We crown him the Lord of peace and pray that this Prince of Peace will enter the anxious and troubled corners of our own lives with the peace that passes understanding. And we crown him the Lord of love and pray that we may leave this place today to share this amazing love of Jesus with a hurting world. We ask this in the royal name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship on this day. You will notice that on the very front of your bulletin, it says on this day, we are honoring all mothers and graduates in our lives. It is Mother's Day and we offer a very happy Mother's Day. It is also a time when we have various graduates sitting here that we will honor 
a special time. And we realize that family members have come to be a part of this time of honoring uh, mothers and graduates. Welcome to all of you. If you are a guest with us, we are so glad that you have come to be with us. We would encourage you to take a, a guest card that you will find in the pew rack in front of you. Fill that out, drop it in the offering plate as it comes by later. We would love to know of your presence with us and uh, be able to share with you following worship. We're glad that you are here. If you're joining with us by television or online, we are glad that you have chosen to worship with us on this day as we celebrate Mother's Day, as we honor graduates, and most of all, as we worship the God who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let us then continue with our worship together. Sanctuary. 
Yes, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Would you pray with me now as we pray for mothers? Mothering God, on this day, when we celebrate mothers in many different forms, we draw on the image of you as one who nurtures, who gathers, who protects. We pray for those women who have nurtured us as mothers and who are, who are no longer with us and whom we miss dearly. We reflect upon those women who have influenced our own lives in so many ways, and we do give thanks. We pray for the women around the world who are working long days and nights to raise their children right now. We pray for the mothers around the world who have fled violence and difficult situations, including refugees, and who have been separated from their children or experienced the tragedy of the death of a child. We pray for mothers living in uncertainty and facing the unknown. We pray for all the women who are expecting but aren't quite mothers yet. We give thanks for these soon-to-be mothers. We pray for families where a mother's illness has led to an early death. We pray for those who stepped in to help with care and nurture of the children, including extended family. And we especially, we pray for children in distant parts of the globe who take on the role of mother when they themselves are still only children. We pray for the women who took in others' children through adoption and foster care. We give thanks this morning for these women with their big hearts. We pray for those women who have lost a child to death and must carry on. We pray for strength and courage for the mothers who have faced grief and loss. We pray for women whose children have grown and whom they now seldom see. We pray for mothers who are at a distance from their children. We pray for all the women who have desperately wanted to, to have children of their own, but chose instead to mother everyone else. We thank God for these mothers in spirit. We pray for those troubled by the prospect of motherhood, perhaps too soon or too few resources to care for a child. Mothering God, we offer these prayers to you this day. Hear now the prayers of our own hearts as we give thanks for or intercede on behalf of mothering figures in our lives. Amen.
Well, last week I stood here as we celebrated uh, the youth of our church with Youth Sunday. I can step this way a little bit. I'm inviting our graduates up here now as we focus on the next stage of life for our young people, our high school and college graduates who are here representing their accomplishment and their achievement as they move into college or move away from college. Uh, let me say first, I think this is the first time this has ever happened, that all five of you are either going to college in Georgia or graduating from a college in Georgia. So we've got the state very well represented uh, here today. Uh, but we're going to recognize these individuals this morning, celebrate with them their accomplishment, and also uh, offer a blessing to them and those who could not be with us uh, this morning. You'll see in your order of worship an insert recognizing a number of college and high school graduates who are connected to our church either as members of our church or the grandchildren uh, of members of our church. And so we want to recognize and bless all of them. Uh, but today, we will say a special uh, congratulations to these five. And so I'm going to invite our pastor, Doc, to uh, help us congratulate them with a gift on behalf of the church. Our high school graduates, uh, Juliana Kruger is graduating from uh, North Cobb High School. Uh, she is the daughter of Dean and Sheree Kruger, and she is the granddaughter of Abe and Verlene Berg, who you might know uh, here in our church. And so. Uh, Juliana is graduating from North Cobb and will be attending Kennesaw State University in the fall. So congratulations. Christopher Malike graduated yesterday from Woodward Academy. Uh, and he uh, is the son of the very proud parents, Steve and Melody Malike, and the grandson of Shirley Wood, and will be attending Georgia State University in the fall uh, with plans to move towards Georgia Tech in the future. And then Lauren Van Atta. Uh, is the daughter of Eric and Karen Van Atta, and she is graduating from Grady High School, attending the University of North Georgia this fall uh, with plans to move towards the University of Georgia. <clears throat> so congratulations to the three of you high school graduates. Let's give them a round of applause. <clears throat> and then our college graduates who have also just recently graduated, Kevin yesterday and Charlotte a week ago, uh, and so Charlotte Bunch uh, is the daughter of Jeff and Terry Bunch. She graduated from the Georgia Institute of Technology uh, with a degree, a Bachelor of Science in Nuclear and Radiological Engineering. So if you need a radiological engineer, I know one. And then Kevin Scott Kelly, a graduate of Mercer University yesterday, uh, a fellow proud Mercer Bear. He is the son of Drew and Nancy Kelly, and he earned a degree of Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. So another engineer if you need one. But congratulations to all five of you. <clears throat> and before we offer a blessing to them, I'd like to recognize some of you all who have had an impact in their life. If you are a family member of one of these five individuals, would you please stand? If you are a family member, parent, grandparent, uh, aunt, uncle, now, if you are somebody in this church who has had a, an impact in their life in some way, perhaps you taught them Sunday school, you led them in VBS, you chaperoned a trip, uh, you were involved in their life in this church in some way, would you please stand as well? So let's give these folks a round of applause as well and a thank you. Now you all may be seated and let us pray a prayer of blessing for these and all of our graduates this year. Let us pray. Before you were even formed, God knew you. While in your mother's womb, God named you. At your birth, God's breath filled you with life. Today we celebrate what you have become at this moment in time. And so we pray, God of our beginnings, we thank you for the gifts of these graduates, their excitement, their awesome wonder and curiosity, their open speech and encouraging words. Their contributions have blessed and challenged us, and we have become a richer and more diverse community because of them. As they step forward into the world that awaits, Comfort their fears with the full knowledge of your divine presence. Strengthen their resolve to walk in the footsteps of Jesus as modern-day disciples 
in a world that needs their spirit. Guide their feet as they move through life, protecting them from the pitfalls of darkness, while they help lead future generations into the warmth and promise of your light. We ask this blessing upon each of them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. As high school seniors who have grown up in this church, we want to take a moment to say thank you. We are so grateful for all this church has done for us and for our families along the way. For all who have helped us as children learn the stories of Bible and nurture and faith from the beginning, thank you. For all who have took us on trips, taught Sunday school, and helped us experience new things, thank you. To all who have supported us and encouraged us, helping us shape our faith along the way towards the young people that we are today, thank you. You have all helped us in too many ways for us to mention them all. We would like to mention one particular. One way that this church has helped me is by giving me a home and some of my best friends. The church has helped me by teaching me to be selfless towards others, especially in times of need. Thank you, thank you all, our church family, for your ministry to us all on the way. We are so grateful. One way you have showed your support to us and to this church is by giving financially. Your giving has allowed us to go on trips, retreats, mission trips, and allowed us to have children and youth ministers that have been meaningful. Consider now how you have given financially to continue these great ministries in our church. Let us pray. Loving God, as your community of faithful followers, Remind us what it means to be grateful and what it means to be generous. We give these offerings in gratitude, rejoice in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings we give ourselves, may we live with generous hearts and open hands. Amen. I invite you to join me in the responsive reading, as printed in your bulletin, responsive reading about the commitment of our lives. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. O Lord, you are our Father. We are clay, and you are our Potter. We are all the work of your hand. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Then Jesus said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me.
Let me add my congratulations to the graduates, but also say that Chris and Lauren came up here and talked about the way this church uh, shaped them into virtuous people. And then one of them stole my pastoral prayer right from the pulpit. So whichever of you has it, read along. This one will be close. <laughs> Let's pray together. Oh God, we give thanks for sanctuary. Life is fast and hard, demanding. And in here, in your presence, in the peace of this room, we find you and we find ourselves. Make your presence known to us this hour. Even as we celebrate those who have accomplished great things in learning, we pray that we will not only be smart but wise, that we will root our lives in things that endure that we will find in this sacred space a reconnection with the things that matter. Love, relationship, faith, discipline. As we celebrate love, we celebrate our mothers and the other maternal figures in our life who have modeled your grace. For most of us, the closest thing we have known to your unending love and your perfect love is the love of our mother. We pray that we might respond to that gift, not just with flowers and lunch, but a commitment to be the person our mother dreamed we would be. And may that wisdom start in your presence, and may it start today as we shape ourselves more into the love of Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. And now, because they did leave Psalm 1, we hear the very first psalm, the psalm that transitions into the hymnal of the Hebrew faith, this call to wisdom. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is the law of the Lord, and on His law they meditate day and night, they are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Then, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun their heavenly Father's realm. Shine forth as the sun in their heavenly Father's realm. Then shall the righteous shine
joy on their head shall be forever lasting joy on their head shall be forever lasting and all sorrow and mourning shall flee away shall to shine forth as the sun in their heavenly Father's realm. Shine forth, shine in their heavenly Father's realm. Shine There is an eternal question with big consequence that gets asked a few times over the course of your life in ways that change the direction of everything, and then it gets asked in smaller ways every day. Am I going to live my life this way or this way? As I said, sometimes we answer that in the grand themes of our life? Am I going to live my life as a Christian? Am I going to orient my life as a Christ follower or am I going to follow some other star? Then it gets, gets fleshed out every day in smaller ways in other questions. Am I going to hedge or fudge or look at that website one more time when I swore no more? But how we answer the, <coughs> the first, the ultimate, the fundamental question matters deeply. What is true north? How will I aim and orient my life so that even if I stray out of my lane, at least I will have identified my lane? What is my true orienting vocation? Well, the wisdom literature does much to focus on that question. Some of the Old Testament writings are identified as wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and others. Are you going to live your life this way or this way? It puts it out in stark, clear ways. And that is usually the question of wisdom lit. But the first teachers of wisdom were our mothers. They were the ones who pointed to the way of wisdom and the way that leads to destruction and made that clear for us. If John jumps off the, off the roof, are you going to jump off the roof? You don't have to do what everybody else does, you know. And then... Wisdom literature is not just the domain of the Bible. Every culture, every era has had some form of wisdom literature. Early in the founding of America, Benjamin Franklin published Poor Richard's Almanac, and it has that same flavor. It's wisdom literature. It's this or it's this. 
Fools need advice most, but wise men are only the better for it. Content makes poor men rich. Discontent makes rich men poor. Are you going to live your life this way, or are you going to live your life this way? Either or, clear, this or that. And the biblical Proverbs do that too. The book of Proverbs, those who conceal their sins do not prosper, but those who confess and renounce them find mercy. You see, when the stakes are high, the, the wisdom literature usually creates these really sharp divides, draws things in big caricature size warnings. This leads to life. This leads to death. So that we'll pay attention. And in today's psalm, the stakes are really, really high. And so it said really, really loudly, where you plant your tree makes all the difference. It's written loudly. Psalm 1 is one of the few psalms characterized as wisdom psalms. It's part of the wisdom literature and it strikes with that same stark choice. It's this or that. It's life or death. It almost yells at us with the clarity. There are 150 psalms, but they did not, of course, first arrive in book form across the centuries They had to be collected and ordered. And so, why put this one first? Well, in the Hebrew tradition, the most central part of Scripture is the Torah, the law, the first five books. But the Psalms are the hymnal of the faith. The law says, thou shalt, thou shalt not. And the Psalter is a kind of poetic expression of what thou shall and thou shalt not looks like. And like other wisdom literature, the wisdom Psalms often point us to a binary choice. It is this or this. The fool goes here, the wise go here, the evil take this road, the righteous take this one. It's plain, it's unadorned, it's clear. We know it's not simple. Living out the way of wisdom is never simple. But if we peel back and peel back and get underneath, we will find at the core that each of us has made some fundamental life choice about where we're going. Psalm 1 is kind of like a bridge with a flashing warning sign. It's it's a bridge, it's an entry point from the law and the prophets into the poetry of the Psalms, proclaiming that the wise meditate on the law day and night. But it's also a warning. There are two paths, there are two ways you can go. Choose wisely, it's this or that. Like a later poet once wrote, two roads diverged in a wood. You can't take both roads at one time. You got to choose one. The first road, if you take it, could mean you choose the way of the wicked. I was probably surprised supposed to read uh, The Great Gatsby in high school, but I I didn't. About 50 years after it was written, Robert Redford starred in the motion picture, but I passed on that too. I I was 11 when that came out. It seemed a little highbrow. I went to see uh, The Man with the Golden Gun and Young Frankenstein, which also came out the same year. But in 2013, when Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, that version hit the theaters, Melissa and I went to see uh, the movie version. But 
I don't want to spoil this for any of you uh, if you hadn't gotten around to it yet, but it's not like I'm telling the end of the Avengers movie. I mean, you've had since 1925 to read the book. <laughs> well, close your ears if you don't want to hear any of it. Nick, the narrator in the story, sees Gat Gatsby's mansion across the water, and Gatsby's got it all. He's unnaturally handsome. That's why he's played by Redford and DiCaprio. He's obviously loaded. Beautiful women swoon in his presence. He's in love with a married woman, but so what? For a man of appetites, it's all about his needs and nothing else. He lives in a mansion on Long Island, throws outrageous parties for the beautiful people of New York. He lives the life of custom shirts and rendezvous and dinner at the Plaza Hotel and a yellow ragtop Rolls Royce. F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote the book in 1925, but the reason the book is a classic is that it is sadly timeless. Sadly timeless. The cars change, the custom shirt styles change, but the frenzy doesn't. The pursuit of the Gadsby life is one of the two roads the psalmist is talking about, and it's also by far the most popular of the two roads. Self serving pleasure. And every era since the psalm was written and every era since 1925 has been marked by hordes of people who are just in search of satisfying the happy appetite. Self-serving pleasure, and I've got to have it now. I want my MTV. Wendy's, do what tastes right, L'Oreal, because I'm worth it. Now. And I said... The book is sadly timeless because at the end of The Great Gatsby, it closes like every other self-serving life ends. At the end of the book, the narrator, Nick, and a few reporters are the only ones to attend Jay Gatsby's funeral because in the end, he was like chaff that the wind drives away. In fact, that's how the psalmist describes people who take that road. The people who live for their own crazed satisfaction. In this first psalm, the poet psalmist makes his own stark contrast. There are two kinds of people, the righteous and the wicked. And he said the wicked are like chaff that the wind just drives away. Now, let's step back and unpack wicked uh, first. We only use that term uh, about the most vile among us, you know, like Cinderella's stepsisters and Cruella de Vil. We also don't use the term righteous very much. It sounds a little bit extreme, and we don't talk about many people as being righteous. The only people you would call wicked might be like your younger brother or your ex. The only people you would, well, you, who would you call righteous, right? But remember that the, that the wisdom writer draws things big and loud with contrast we can't miss. And so, the psalmist uses extremes, two different paths, two different ways of orienting life, wicked and righteous. And some people orient their lives towards selfishness and getting and hoarding and what is temporary. Their lives are defined by appetite, and it's so shallow. And in its extreme, it is pure evil. But most of us know it in milder doses. And in milder doses, it's the sad people you know who hope that the next get, the next happy fix, the next trinket will be the one that will satisfy the hunger inside. The other 
is the way of blessing, the satisfied ones, those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. They're the people who give, who seek joy over temporary happiness, who invest in things eternal. Their lives are defined by relationship and significance, meaning and blessing. And in its extreme, these people are called the righteous. But in the milder doses that we're more familiar with, they're the people you admire. The people who seem to live lives that are full, that seem to give and walk with the light steps of joy. Well, as I promised a few weeks back when I got back from the Holy Land, I said, I'm going to sprinkle my sermons with a little bit of stuff I learned. Well, in some weeks coming up, I'm going to do a, a slideshow presentation, PowerPoint, something. Show you the pictures, but here's a, here's a, a, a peek in. Most of my pictures are some shades of tan. Almost everything I saw in Israel was tan. I'd look out the bus, so on that side there'd be acres and acres of limestone. And then I'd look out this side of the bus and there'd just be tan, just kind of all over the place. Now today the Israelis are among the most advanced in the world at irrigation techniques, but in the biblical days the water was where the water was, and it was not in many places. Southern Israel then and now, mostly desert. Northern Israel, mostly tan. But some areas had water, life-giving water, and people who went to live there could grow food that would not only feed people this year, but next year they could grow food again, and it would produce food again. And this miracle was possible only in the places where there was water water. And the psalmist says that those who pursue the way of wisdom are like trees planted by water. In a vast arid world there are only a few places where people have found a source of nutrition and life and water and rooted themselves next to the water. And so, if Gadsby illustrates one road on this Mother's Day, I'm going to use my grandmother to illustrate the other. On Mother's Day, I'm grateful again for all the women in my life who invested, shaped, loved. But when I think about this particular passage, about what it looks like to be rooted Next to a stream, I think of my dad's mother, Mama Hollingsworth. Her simple house smelled like country fried steak and okra. Her recliner sat next to a lamp, a, a floor lamp that had one of those little circle shelves in the middle of it. You've seen that? It was just big enough for the copy of the Greenwood Index Journal and the crossword she had pulled out of it, and her Bible. Every morning she read the paper. She pulled the crossword out, worked it complete with a pencil she had sharpened with a pocket knife. And she read again her ragged Bible. Her Bible ragged from use. Because this routine was every morning. Every day she read the paper, every day she worked the crossword, every day she read her Bible, and every day she prayed. And when she bowed to pray, her root system went down, reached down into the place where the water flows, 
And every trunk and branch and flower of her life found food and refreshment and life, and she was ready to walk out into the world with grace. And she did. She walked with grace, every word measured and kind, every experience felt, every person in her orbit blessed, power, strength, kindness, beauty, because she planted her life by a stream. Most of Israel is tan. It's rocks and dust and chaff. But some places lush and green because there is a life-giving stream of water. So hear the psalm again against the backdrop of a land without much water, against the backdrop of all the Gatsby people you know who are not rooted at all. And on this Mother's Day, hear it against the backdrop of a woman you know in your life who is most fully alive. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord and on His law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all they do they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Well, the Lord doesn't wish that any of us would perish. (laughs) Why, He gave us mothers, agents of God's wisdom who point to the way of life. But still we make our own choices. We either plant ourselves in the shallow rocky soil and follow a majority world that lives every day for nothing bigger than a shallow satisfaction. Or we plant ourselves in places of nourishment, in prayer and community, worship and witness, Bible and belief, and we let our lives drink from the source of life. And the psalmist says it's an either or choice but it matters deeply where you choose to plant yourself. Would you stand and sing, respond, and pray about where you want your life to be planted as we sing the songs of faith? Go now in the assurance that God goes with you. Go and plant your life in a source 
that will endure. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us again at Second Potsdalian Baptist Church. As you can tell, we take worship seriously. It's a central part of who we are as the people of God. And every Sunday we're together, there's a sense of expectation and vibrancy. But worship is only a part of who we are as God's people because we're also doing life together here. We play together and learn together and serve together, laugh together. We take meals to each other when babies are born, and we see each other's children in plays. We eat dinner in each other's homes. We go to each other's bedside when we're sick. In one of her books, author Brene Brown makes a great distinction between fitting in and belonging. And at Second Punch, you don't have to worry about fitting in. This is a place to belong a place to bring your real self and find community. We're always happy to have you worshiping with us on your screen at home, but I also want to extend an invitation for you to come and be a part of the rest of our life together. Life is hard and we shouldn't do it alone. So I look forward to welcoming you in person one day soon.